Hello, John. Yes. Hey. <laughs> Welcome back to the real world. Thanks. Boy, it uh, feels strange being here. It's been so long. Yeah, it's been, what, two weeks, three weeks? I think it's been three weeks. So you talked to, uh, let's see, you talked to Bob about, Bob Wright about um, sleep. Oh, yeah, about sleep and insomnia. And then Christine Keneally about languages and shipwrecked babies on the Galapagos. Yeah, boy, it, the, those were great chats, and it was weird the, the sort of self-referential quality to both. So uh, you and Bob were both apparently sleep-deprived when you yeah. were uh, talking, and um, and then, of course, whenever you've got, you're have you talking about uh, linguistics, there's this kind of weird mirror quality to it. Yeah, that's true, this kind of Hofstadterian loop, self-reference. Yeah. And, yeah, I really like that stuff. Well, I really enjoyed your talk with, with Bob and finding out all kinds of things about him that uh, I didn't know. We just scratched the surface. I mean, you, I'm yeah, sure you noticed I know. Bob was... And you're still... Bob was a, you, you managed to, to guard guard the family secrets pretty carefully, I thought. And yeah. With the, the, oh, oh, you mean my own secrets? Yeah, yeah, like uh, you know, prep school and... Oh, I have no secrets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just th I just didn't think anybody would be interested. No, Bob was, uh, you know, you mean he divulged, divulged some really interesting stuff about his his childhood, some of which yeah. I hadn't heard before. Yeah. Uh, but then he really he put the door down, probably wisely. Yeah, it was very uh, very good conversation, though. I th I'm starting to I think of it as the gold standard. Oh well, thank it was you. Really good. Well, you know, well I have to say I'm. Um, it's a little daunting to be back to blogging heads because I feel as though the bar has been raised now I mean you got this mailing um, from blogging heads with all the new and improved guidelines oh yeah right um, yeah I think a lot of that was already in place it's just getting more emphasis yeah, yeah so I, I hope sound, it doesn't like become overproduced although I don't think that's probably a huge worry well, as long as they have us here, there's no danger of that. Well, yeah, you know, Garage Band TV. That's how I described it to Christine. And I think yeah, that's, that was, that, that's part of the appeal, I think. That's a nice phrase. Well, at least um, now, uh, you know, I guess as a result of uh, this New York Times syndication, we're all getting um, $1,000 a show, so that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a good rumor. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's uh, you, that. The, the number has um, too many ones on it. <laughs> I couldn't get you to bite on that. Huh? <laughs> so it's just ludicrous on its face. It is. It is unfortunately <laughs> true. But um, ah, maybe so, someday. So where have you, you? You were in in Portugal, right? Yeah, it's you know. Uh, so I go for months or years uh, with nobody wanting to hear anything that I have to say. And then, uh, you know, I get invitations to speak in clusters. So I had this cluster of uh, talks that I had to give over the last couple of weeks. And by far the the most interesting and exotic was at a, a conference in Lisbon, mm -hmm. Portugal, on uh, the title is, Is Science Near Its Limits? Ah, and, <laughs> you, you wrote yeah, a book so, about something about that, right? Yeah. Well, it turns out that my uh, at the end of science meme uh, infected uh, the mind of a uh, very prominent literary critic named George Steiner. Yeah, I saw that. I was wondering, you know, why Steiner would be would be uh, hosting a conference on science or the end of science or so. So it's because yeah, well, he read your book. Well, I, apparently so. So he's somebody who's always, you know, I used to love reading his essays in the 70s and 80s yeah. in, in The New Yorker. Uh -huh. And uh, he's somebody who, who likes to take on uh, grand ideas. So I thought, you know, I guess the end of science was just uh, uh, grand or grandiose or pretentious enough for him to uh, seize upon it. And he's been trying to convince this uh, this organization called the Gulbenkian Foundation hmm. in uh, Lisbon for about 10 years to host this conference and and uh, they finally did. Now just the story behind the Gulbenkian uh, Foundation is interesting in itself. Have you ever heard of this? Oh, I hadn't until, um, until I oh, heard I you were going there and then um, when, when Peter Woit 
um, he, he he was there too, right? The guy who uh, yes. who writes uh, the not even not even wrong website. Um, yes, and a book called Not Even Wrong. Yeah, so I saw his posting about about um, you being there, and then I went and you know clicked over to look at the website for the conference. But that was the first time I'd heard of the Galbenkian Foundation. Well, the Gal- Kalust Galbenkian was a an Armenian who was born in. Um, I, you know, like around 1870 or so mm-hmm. in Turkey, and by the time uh, he was 30 or 40 years old, he controlled a substantial portion of the world's oil reserves. Huh. And I, I'd never heard of him, but this is a guy who was a major figure in uh, world history, and particularly in Eastern Europe and the Middle East. Mm-hmm. He At one time, he controlled the entire Iraqi oil reserve, big wow. chunks of uh, Saudi Arabia, huh. and he helped the great powers carve all that up in the 20s and 30s, wow. and as a result, he became a very, very wealthy man, and uh, he ended up settling in Lisbon and left his fortune to this foundation, which promotes uh, culture and science, it's got a beautiful museum there in uh, Lisbon based on his personal collection and it's like the Met in New York it was one of the the most amazing collection I collections I'd ever seen wow. every kind of art hmm. from uh, ancient Egyptian art right up to the present wow. and uh, they flew us first class all the way over uh, everything was just <laughs> uh, top of the line oh man it was such a trip oh that sounds great that's wonderful and the meeting was pretty cool too. Yeah, I got I got the impression from White's blog that um, you had a bit of a chilly reception from some of your old nemeses. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was that was part of what made it really interesting to me was that um, I uh, some of my co-speakers were uh, were people I interviewed in the past or encountered in various ways. One was Gerald Edelman, a Nobel laureate and, and neuroscientist. Oh, Ger- Ger- Gerald Edelman as in uh, neural, uh, neural Edelmanism. Or, or, <laughs> no, no, neural Darwinism. <laughs> well, yes, except that Francis Crick thought that it should be neural Edelmanis- Edelmanism. We, we can get into that in a little bit. Because uh, <laughs> no one then, else uh, can understand the theory. That's right. Yeah. Uh, then Freeman Dyson, oh. who's, I think we both uh, are fans of his. Yeah. He was there also. And, of course, George Steiner, who's this really uh, remarkable figure. But Lewis Wolpert, a British biologist. I had oh, a very wow. serious run-in with him about ten years ago. A, a furious um, run-in? Well, he was just... I This was while I was in London um, peddling the end of science. Uh-huh. And I was at a reception with all these British scientists and... Uh, Journalist uh, John Maynard Smith had just given a talk, and we all met afterwards. And Wolpert was introduced to me, and he became so apoplectic at the sight of me uh, that I, I swear I thought he was going to sock me one. Oh. He, he he just started sputtering in my face how awful my book was, and he was especially upset by my treatment of um, neuroscience. So I had a chapter called The End of Neuroscience right, in my right. book. And uh, and Wolpert said, uh, first of all, I hadn't interviewed any real neuroscientist. I just interviewed Francis Crick, who's a physicist, and Roger Penrose, who's a physicist, mm-hmm. and Gerald Edelman, who's just an immunologist, for Christ's sake. <laughs> and uh, so he was really chiding me. And then the problem was he he went stalking away before I could respond. Yeah. And actually, I you know what I wanted to tell him was that. Um, was that uh, I agreed with him, and I thought I needed to devote much more time to the science of the brain and mind uh, than I did in the end of science before dismissing it. And so yeah. that was my second point. Right, but right. But Wol- Wolpert was there. We he was great. We made up. Oh, good. Uh, but uh, you know what I wanted to start by saying was um, what I thought was the most newsworthy um, event at this meeting. Which was that Wolf Singer mm-hmm. was one of the he's one of the leading neuroscientists in the world. Oh yeah, uh, he's one, he, uh, memories particularly, right? Well, not only memory, he's the person who popularized uh, this. It's called a population code uh, when you have large numbers of neurons that are firing at the same frequency and uh, at exactly the same time. So these are called. Uh, 
uh, synchronous oscillations. Mm -hmm. and, and especially, there's one particular oscillation, about 40 hertz, uh, 40 firings per second yeah. of, of the neurons, that he thought might be important. And Francis Crick and Christoph right, uh, Koch right. later seized on this as a possible uh, solution to the problem of consciousness, that yeah. 40 hertz oscillations sort of bound together the firing of diverse groups of neurons. Yeah. But anyway, so... Yeah, so that's the, was it the alpha? Is that called the alpha frequency? Or Oh, God, I can't, yeah. I can't remember. Uh, alpha, baby. It was, it was yeah, yeah, anyway. One of those... Neither here nor there. Those, Maybe the yeah. fader rhythm. But listen to this. So he... So Singer... You know, almost everybody just... They gave a talk about their work, their pet theory, yeah. and so forth. So Singer did that. He updated us on um, synchronous oscillations. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of his talk, and this wasn't a total surprise to me because he'd been speaking about this at lunch, but I never thought he'd mention it in his public speech. He said that he had just been to Nepal and had met these um, Tibetan monks there, uh -oh. or uh, Buddhist monks, who had claimed to have psychic powers. To be able to, uh, you know, they were clairvoyant. They claimed to be clairvoyant, and you know, have all these, uh, these, you know, supernatural capabilities. A lot and of people so claim that. But well, but <laughs> yeah. Singer took it seriously because <laughs> they were Buddhist He's, monks, or I he, mean, did he actually see a demonstration that? that, that he that said he wasn't convinced, but he said he was open-minded to the possibility that psychic phenomena. Are real, mm -hmm. and he th he was urging his fellow scientists to start investigating ESP. Yeah. And then, in what was clearly the understatement of the whole meeting, he said, um, "You know, if we do validate the existence of ESP, this will require some serious revision of our theories." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hmm. And I was I was like, "Holy shit!" You know, that I. Yeah, I, I was, uh, you know, so it raised this whole issue because I had thought I don't know. You have to tell me what you think about ESP. I had thought we sort of had decided once and for all, ESP is not real. Well, yeah, and I mean, you know, research still still goes on, and occasionally someone will you know claim to find just a slight little statistical variation in some guessing game that they say, oh well, look, this may be. A little glimmer of ESP, but I think in every case I know of, it's been you know people were able to dismiss it as a statistical fluke, and in any case, it wasn't it wasn't a very big fluctuation. Well, so what? I mean, just give me your gut feeling. Do you think this is real? No, I mean, all the time no. we've expended on it. No, you, no, I don't. You don't. But uh, <laughs> okay. I mean, obviously, yeah. <laughs> ah, you're such a wet blanket. George. No, I mean the understate. <laughs> I mean, you, you have to come up with some kind of mechanism for how, you know, I suppose that, um, you know, you could concoct some theory that involved um, electromagnetic resonance between one brain or another if it was, you know, <laughs> if you were, like, touching foreheads or something. But Yeah. <laughs> but you know, to, to produce enough energy to be like a, a radio wave signal, you know, stretching for, you know, miles... You know, you'd think that you know that would have you know shown up on on someone's EEG, but you know maybe it's um, it's all vibrating in some extra dimension or it's some kind of energy that hasn't been discovered yet. So yeah, it would definitely cause them to have to readjust some of their theories. I think <laughs> not just of um, neuroscience and biology, but of physics. Uh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. that would be. But there's always you know there's always people that you know still you know, hold out some kind of belief, often based on personal experience, um, in ESP and in paranormal phenomena, including a lot of physicists. And Absolutely. Yeah, like when I was um, um, brainstorming, for examples for a piece I did in the Week in Review recently about um, Nobel laureates who've kind of, you know, gone off the end and said... Which I love, by the way. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great piece. It was a great way to sort of... I like... You know, it was sort of an oblique way of getting at it, but in a way, it was sort of the important meta issue. Well, yeah, that's what raised. interested me because so much had been written about 
the issue itself, you know. Yes. I mean, the Week in Review, they, they try to, you know, you try to find some, you know, use an event of the news as a tangent to, you know, write about some, you know, interesting ideas. And, 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 and actually, I, you know, I'd sent you an email before that asking for your suggestion, and you had, um, you had mentioned Brian Josephson. Yes. Yeah, who, who got a Nobel Prize for work involving superconductivity, and and mm-hmm. um, Josephson believes in in ESP. And then when I did a little more research for the story, I found this wonderful this wonderful um, example that I talked to Christine about, where the British uh, Mail Service, the Royal Royal Mail, had uh, issued commemorative stamps for the Nobel Prize centenary. And there was a pamphlet published by the Royal Mail that came out with it in which they talked about different issues in science and they had this line that uh, uh, about the you know the wonderful world that quantum mechanics had opened up and how uh, you know this could lead to solution of all kinds of long-standing problems including uh, ESP right yeah and then you know all these people kind of <laughs> scientists in Britain reacted you know, with astonishment, and then it turned out they'd gotten that from, from Brian Josephson. I couldn't believe that they didn't vet that yeah. uh, in advance. <laughs> you know, when I was uh, at, so at this conference, Wolf Singer spoke on the um, the first day, and I spoke on the second day, and uh, as usual, there are a couple of people who spoke about string theory there, so yeah. Peter White was putting it down, of course, but then there were at least two speakers, uh, particle physicists from CERN who were defending string theory um, very strongly and um, I thought it would be so I, you know, I'm taking my usual shots at string theory in my talk yeah. uh, and I thought it would be funny uh, to say that uh, you know, in a reference to what Wolf Singer had said that maybe the, um, the answer to string theory's problems is, is that they should um, propose a new uh, particle called the psychon which would involve paranormal effects. Yeah. And I ended up not doing that. But um, I was Googling uh, Brian Josephson to see what he'd been saying recently, yeah. and it turns out... Psychons? He, he has written a paper called String Theory, Universal Mind, and the Paranormal. Oh. I'll, put a, I'll put a link oh. to it um, on our site. Uh, you know, I couldn't really understand quite how it works, but I think he said that you have quantum uh, vacuum bubbles Mm -hmm. um, in the brains of string theorists that um, God, I'm not sure how it works. That's all I remember. (laughs) Quantum quantum vacuum bubbles in the brains of string theorists, which actually on, you know, sort of on the surface makes sense. It seems sort of plausible. (laughs) Uh, But uh, you know, so you're trying to. You know, here I was trying to come up with a parody of uh, of these ideas, and it turns out that there's somebody, a Nobel laureate, yeah. who is proposing them seriously. Wow. You know, another person at this uh, conference, Freeman Dyson, who I just mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he's, I, I think didn't, didn't he? He said something about ESP, right? That's right. He wrote a review. Uh, which I was just stunning to me. Um, it came out. Uh, let me see. I yeah. jotted this down. Um, I think it was about three years ago mm-hmm. in the New York Review of Books. He reviewed a couple of books on um, the paranormal. Yeah. And it you know sort of a straightforward review, but at the very end, he uh, said that Dyson said that he believed in what he calls psi, which is sort of the British term for for ESP yeah. and. Um, he has, I think it was an aunt who was a uh, very important figure in the uh, British Psychical Society. Oh, yeah. And uh, so I actually, after Singer's talk in um, Lisbon, I sought out Dyson and asked him what he thought. And he said, uh, his take was sort of interesting. He said he didn't think that science would ever pin down ESP. Dyson was sure it was real. Huh. But he, he thought that ESP only occurs under... Uh, when when somebody is under severe stress of some kind or is undergoing a traumatic experience and uh, therefore it can't be replicated in a laboratory. It also means he doesn't think that you can be sort of a professional psychic and have these, <laughs> you know, mind reading ability yeah. or clairvoyance at will. Well, for him to say something like that, I mean, he must have had some experience that he 
you know, attribute that he, you know, he feels like he experienced some kind of extrasensory perception or, or, or knows someone, you know, very closely who he trusts implicitly who, who claims that. I mean... Almost all people... There, I mean, there's no evidence for it. There would have to be some strong, subjective gut feeling that something happened that they couldn't explain any other way. And Wolf Singer, at, uh, when he was talking about this over lunch before his talk, his public talk, um, said that he'd had uh, an experience where he was in a, a strange city and he he lost his children. Mm-hmm. And um, he said that he he found them in a way that was really sort of logically impossible. He found his way to them going on this kind of hunch, and he was in a very distressed state of mind, and he found them, and he thought that um, maybe that was some sort of mm. psychic experience. Mm. So in his case, there was a personal experience. I think you're right that... Yeah. People have these, if you have that sort of experience, you can't explain it logically, you seize on this possibility that there are um, paranormal effects at work. Yeah. And then, you know, whenever you have anything like that that appears to be an anomaly, you know, you can always, you know, fit it into the, the dominant framework, you know, say that there was some kind of um, unconscious mental processing going on in his mind that suggested this place for what actually were logical reasons and some connections that he'd just forgotten or or again that it was just random i mean i mean obviously if you lose your children in a large city they're not going to be very far away yeah you know, unless you know they they jumped on a bus or a train or were you know abducted by aliens or or child kidnappers um but you know there's some, you know some people would you know really struggle I think that's what I would do to try to find a sensible explanation that fit into the way that we believe the world works, you know, in the yes. experience of thousands of years of civilization and hundreds of years of science, and yet other people kind of are looking for something to take this leap into you know, the idea that, ah, maybe there's some big mystery that's still lurking out there, you know, like Jungian synchronicity, where... You know, you have two things that seem to be coincidental, and yet really there there's an a-causal connecting principle. And well, maybe there is. And of course, you know, quantum mechanics is a-causal, so you can you know concoct these these pseudoscientific edifices. Yeah, it's uh, you know, I I realize though that I think you and I might be in the minority on this. Uh, most people. So I, well, I was believing in ESP. Yeah, probably. Yeah, but I mean, even among scientists. Uh, so I was at this oh. when Singer was talking at this table. There were maybe eight people at the table over lunch, yeah. and he was describing his, ex, you know, his, his meeting these monks, and then Singer describes his own experience. And basically, everybody's kind of nodding and saying, "Oh yeah, I, you know, had those sorts of experiences too." And oh, oh you know, there's there's something going on there. And um, I, I was. I was flabbergasted. Yes, yeah, so you've never had an experience like that. I have had experiences like that, yeah. but I guess I rule them out as you know, there is such a thing as dumb luck. Yeah, yeah. And and coincidences. Yeah, a lot I, of cool, a lot of amazing coincidences, quote unquote, turn out not to be so amazing when you really do the math. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I personally, since uh, science is so moribund now. I would love to see mainstream scientists start doing uh, research on um, ESP and so forth. It's just that they, yeah, you know, there, there is have research been doing still, this. So, still kind of smoldering way off in some remote back burner, right? You know, the yes, psychical yeah. research, and they still do the experiments where they have the cards with the four little shapes on them, and, and then you look at them and, 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 they, and try to show that you're, you know, the other person sees the card, you know, what the card is, and then. Is uh, projecting it to you telepathically, supposedly, yeah. and, and you're in different rooms. You can't see the person, so you don't get the clever Hans type type uh, unconscious signaling effects. And then they'll try to see if there's a slight statistical um, variation from chance and you uh, guessing the cards. And mm-hmm. I think that still goes on. But God, I remember when I was in probably 
junior high school, I became fascinated by the idea of ESP, and I'd read some book, and my my best friend Ron Light and I would, uh, we actually got these cards and, and did ESP experiments. And, and did it, did that nah, lead you to believe there's nothing, nothing here? Because nah. I did one of those experiments <laughs> once uh, with a friend of mine. We just talked about it recently. And uh, when we were, I don't know, 17, 18 years old, and of course we were under the influence of something. Oh. And we had a streak of... Um, you know, I think it was a set of five cards, different colors, different shapes. Yeah. I forget I forget the name. It was that standard format with a cross and a circle and anyway. Right, right. And and we got I think I was looking at the card, he's telling me what I've got. Mm. And he got nine in a row. Right. Mm, yeah. And and then we both I I s I wasn't supposed to tell him if he'd gotten them right mm-hmm. until we were all done. But at that point I started giggling or something I couldn't because I I thought obviously you know he was psychic he was reading my mind Um, (laughs) so that's always stuck in my head as an odd thing but you know as I said we were both we were both uh, under the influence so yeah well it's like UFOs uh, I mean you know you know I've certainly seen UFOs and of course there you know UFOs do exist there are objects that are flying and sure enough they're unidentified but uh, yeah you know everything that I've ever seen like that, I can um, easily come up with a with a rational explanation that fits within in the framework. That doesn't mean that I'm right, but it's sort of like uh, you know when James Randi, the magician, uh, proves that it's possible to bend a spoon like the the great psychic uh, Uri Geller does. It's it's possible to do that purely through trickery, and then right. uh, he's not actually. You know, proving that um, Geller himself, I guess, is is doing this trick because he's not like sneaking behind stage or or using um, X-ray vision <laughs> or something. But uh, he's you know he shows that you know there's a perfectly rational, scientific, logical way you could do this and fool people, and and it's very persuasive yeah. because um, you know, it's the old extraordinary uh, claims demand extraordinary proof. And, and Randy's got that million dollar standing. Right. Oh yeah, we uh, talked about offer. that before. Yeah. 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 So you know, um, how, about, how about Gerald Edelman? You said he was uh, the yeah. neural Darwinism guy. Yeah. So I hadn't seen him. I I probably uh, wrote the harshest profile I've ever written. Yeah, I just scientist. reread it yesterday when you mentioned that Edelman had been there. It's really, I think, one of the best things in the book, and, and oh, there's a lot you. of well, really great profiles in there. Well, it it was. It was very harsh, though. I, I yeah. you know, I would admit that, and it, I'm going after his his theory and his personality, and I yeah, well, he's a, has a very harsh personality, right? So he does, and I so I thought that in in some cases, I, you know, sometimes you can describe a scientist's personality, and it's just interesting for its own sake. I, yeah. Ideally, what I try to do is to show that. Uh, understanding the personality helps to understand the theory. Yeah. So in, in Edelman's case, he has this theory that he's tried to create almost an isolation from everything else going on in mm-hmm. in neuroscience. He's created his own language uh, for it. He calls it neural Darwinism. Uh, he's got uh, terms like uh, reentry. He uses yeah. the term uh, group instead of population for. Um, large numbers yeah. of neurons. Well, we, we, we should back, back up a step and say this is a theory of consciousness, like That's how right. consciousness arises from the brain. Exactly. Yeah. And, and okay, and I'll back up even further. Edelman was somebody who won a Nobel Prize for uh, work in uh, immunology that was uh, very important. He basically under he helped to show how the body distinguishes self from. Non-self. Yeah, it's a fascinating theory, which involves, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a lymphocytic Darwinism in a way. Yeah, so he thought that there was sort of a selection principle uh, going on in um, the immune response, and he transferred that idea to uh, the brain, and he thought that there are, there are uh, these competitions between large uh Populations of neurons that determine whether you see this shape out there as, uh, for example, a dog or a cat. Yeah, right. And um, the problem with it was that 
it was actually very similar to things that other people had been saying. It was similar to yeah. some uh, ideas that come out of neural network theory. Um, the sort of uh, there's this guy named Hebb who had been yeah Donald uh, Hebb yeah had been creating yeah, models of neurons the mind that back fire the together wire together and yeah yeah no yeah and it really was done in isolation and um, and plus uh, Edelman would never never concede that there was any relationship to his work and anyone else's and he made other extraordinary claims like that the theory did not involve information processing. Yeah, and and that I mean, here, was. Yeah, let me see if I can remember what the theory, like with immunology. Okay, the idea was originally people thought you know you have these lymphocytes, and and it'll find the little invading, invading um, creature coming you know down your bloodstream or wherever, and it'll there'll be an antigen or a little molecular, molecular, you know ID tag on the invader. And it was originally thought that the lymphocyte would, um, you know, latch on to the invader, and then it would um, basically detect this uh, antigen signature, mold itself to it, and then um, go off and bring that signal back to the immune system and say, you know, here's what we're up against, guys. And then the and then the lymph nodes would produce all of these uh, uh, specialized lymphocytes that could lock on to this antigen and then and then blow up the invader. And then what Edelman went on to show was that actually what happens is that the body makes all these different kinds of antigens that would, I mean, these all these different lymphocytes that are lock and key fits to any conceivable antigen or almost any conceivable antigen. And then an invader comes into the body, one of these lymphocytes will eventually stumble upon the invader and then when it does that that triggers the marshalling of um, the lymph nodes and they make more of these things so it's yeah. it's very different and then and then with the brain i think he's saying that there's all these uh, just as the body is making all these ra- randomly generating all these different kinds of lymphocytes the brain has all these sort of randomized neural connections and then if you get a signal which is like the invader coming in through your senses some of these patterns of neurons, randomly wired neurons, will respond more strongly than others, and then as a result, the connections between them will be strengthened, and then they'll become sort of a sort of a representation of what's going on outside, and it's just sort of the flow of all this that, I mean, it's a fascinating That's good, George. Actually, you make, uh, you do a better job explaining it than... um than Edelman, I, I well, that's I why they call it neural Edelmanism, right? I actually <laughs> right. reviewed the the book, uh, one of the books he wrote, uh, "Bright, Bright Air, Brilliant Fire." Yes, that was sort of his popular uh, version of the theory after he had three highly technical yeah. dense books, and it was still really difficult. And he's still writing books. I just read one actually, coincidentally, last week. Uh, they're much shorter now. This one was called Second Nature." Um, Brain science and human knowledge, and and he again you know, he alludes to the theory all throughout the book, but he says, well, I've already explained this elsewhere, so I won't get into the details. But I, I still don't really get it, and I still don't see how anyone could say that what he's doing is not information processing. What is theory? Well, he's doing? he's he's basically you know one of the themes of his writing is that nobody really understands the brain's complexity before. He came along. And he also <laughs> yeah. emphasizes that the, you know, the each brain is absolutely unique and uh, is shaped by experience. And uh, neurons are constantly shifting their synaptic connections, which of course is you know widely uh, discussed by everybody going back to you know the the 1920s. But uh, you know, so he exaggerates his sort of discovery of that aspect of the brain. But then, I think, in a reaction to cognitive science and artificial intelligence, he says that the brain is not a computer, certainly not a digital computer. Yeah, but nobody then, thinks it's a you know digital computer per se. That's what's well, some people you know still the computer. Most most scientists will just say, well, the computer is a useful model. For understanding yeah, I mean, the all brain, the computers, yeah. I mean, obviously, the brain has units that are getting information in the form of signals, processing them, and sending out, you know, modified signals, and that's information processing, and that's computation. But uh, Edelman seemed to think my impression that I got from his book was that there are actually scientists who think that the brain's working like a von Neumann machine, you know, with the same architecture and 
uh, you know, the, com the idea of a computer is just so much richer and more fluid than that. And well, he so the the huge contradiction in his work, and this, you know, I just remembered when he gave his talk in Lisbon why I'd had such problems with him because at first he's, you know, he was so he's so brilliant and he really, you know, he just has that uh, kind of aura of. I'm smarter than all of you put together, and he, he pulls it off pretty well. He's kind of this creepy-looking guy, but he's clearly extremely intelligent. And he's starting to talk, and I'm going, my God, this guy, how could I have dared to criticize him? And then as he was talking, I remembered all the problems I had with his presentation. Yeah. And the main one was, after going on and on about how the brain is not a computer and ridiculing anybody who would think it is, he presents this video of this robot. Darwin, Darwin, the Darwin machine. Seven. Right. Yeah, so when I was when I interviewed him, he was still at Rockefeller University and he had Darwin Four, I mm -hmm. think. And so I actually went into a room and he showed me Darwin Four, which is this you know, heap of this bucket of bolts that was going around and picking up blocks or something. Right. And and he said it was demonstrating the power of his theory. So it's a robot. Yeah. With a computer for a brain. Yeah, right yeah, after yeah. Well, it's, actually, it's, it's actually hooked to a mainframe computer. Yeah. It's right after he spent all this time telling me that the brain is not a computer. Yeah. He did it again in Lisbon. He showed us a movie of this robot that was just pathetically limited. It was, in this case, it was uh, playing soccer, playing soccer. And, um, you know, so it, it you kick a ball at it and it has little calipers, grabs a ball yeah. and then it... it Kicks it into a goal, yeah. and and Edelman has given us this big riff as we're watching to tell us how you know this uh, this is not this is not computation you're watching. It is something that is based on the competition of um, of uh, different algorithms, and uh, this is what happens in the brain. And I'm thinking, but, yeah, but how is it not computation? That's what right. I mean, the only it's, thing that, that, that where I stumble a little on that is. You can use a, a computer and and um, simulate, say, a hurricane, mm -hmm. but uh, that doesn't mean that the that, that a hurricane is a is a computer or that it's a form of computation. I mean, some people <laughs> would say maybe that it is, but uh, so if you, you but if you use a computer to simulate another information processing entity, you know, like a brain, then. It gets very Except confused. I mean, obviously, of course, that's begging. Edelman, I suppose, would say that's begging the question because you're saying that it's that it's an information processor that you're simulating, and yet you're not simulating it. I mean, that really is the thing that's acting. Exactly. So he's saying <laughs> that the computations, you know, this wasn't, in some sense, it wasn't just a simulation. He said it was. There were real computations being performed. There was a task that this. This thing, and you know, when I was talking to him, he, his argument all involved um, just using, you know, he, he called this the robot his creature. Yeah. He called the computer its brain, yeah. and he insisted that it was learning how to do these things. There yeah. was no sort of, uh, there was no pre-planned. Yeah, step well, that's by step. yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, and I mean, I'm sure he's right. It's a you know, you didn't feed it a program about how to do this. It, but, but you know, computers but lots you can program computers to do that. And, sure, there are yeah. genetic algorithms, yeah, neural networks, exactly. do this kind of thing. You have all sorts of learning programs. Edelman also, when I had spoke to him, um, had emphasized that you know, in a normal uh, computation in a computer. If one step is uh, screwed up, then the whole program is screwed up, and you don't get the the performance that you want. Yeah, again, which isn't it's a parody of what yeah. really happens. Yeah, right. there's all kinds of redundancy. So you know the the issue that this raised for me, this plus Wolf Singer, and you know this is something that you and I, um, it's sort of a, a binding theme of both of our careers. Is <laughs> how do you? How do you tell? I mean, clearly, this is an extremely accomplished, brilliant yeah. person, um, and and he's sort of crossing the line from being a great scientist and in immunology. Mm -hmm. You know, apparently, it, there's no dispute over uh, of what he's no. discovered. No, um, and there's no. Of course, there's also no dispute that Brian Josephson made a great discovery with the Josephson junction and. 
superconductivity. Right. So, but they sort of uh, Josephson clearly and Edelman arguably have crossed the line from being um, geniuses to cranks, yeah. basically. Yeah. And so you know, in a, in a way, my whole career, and as I said, I think this is true of you is. How do you tell the difference between a genius and a crank? Yeah, I think and I'm just less less sure that I can can, can do it. <laughs> right. You're a little more confident in your in your distinctions, but, but I have well, to maybe say, after I, I read this profile of Edelman and I thought, wow, this is really this is really right on. Yeah, and you described well, it. If I if I may, may may quote from from the American science writer John Horgan. Edelman is like a novelist who risks obscurity, even seeks it, in the hope of achieving a deeper truth. He is a practitioner of ironic neuroscience, one who unfortunately lacks the requisite skills. Now, how yeah, did he? <laughs> what did what did he say when you know, oh, when he, like, God. oh, hi, John Horgan, and uh, you know, did he was he icy? Oh well, here's the thing. So I flew from Newark to Lisbon. Um, I'm getting on the plane in Newark and. Right in front of me, I see this big, kind of hunched, black-suited, slightly menacing-looking figure, and I realized it was um, it was Edelman. He was sitting right behind me. Oh, you didn't sit next to him, though. <laughs> no, no, thank God. Who was God, that? There's, God, someone, so there's some famous scientist. Was it Gun- was that Gunther Stent? Gunther Stent. Yeah, he got stuck on a cross-country flight sitting next to Edelman. Yeah, and he said afterwards, Edelman spent the whole time trying to explain his theory, and Stent said at the end he still didn't get it. <laughs> uh, and, and See, this Stent is the is risk of flying first class. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> no, I always sit next to, the, next to the salesman. It's, uh... Well, it's, thank God we didn't sit next to each other. But then when we got to Lisbon, we were met right at the door of the plane by this person from the Gelbenkian Foundation who whisked us through the airport, we didn't even go through customs, got VIP treatment, right into a limo, and so I had to say something. Yeah. Edelman was just kind of walking her along with his head down, so I said, Jerry, <laughs> hey, how you doing? It's Jerry? John Horgan. And, uh, yeah, I mean, sure. Um, and uh, and he looked at me and, and just said, hello. Mm. And, you know, he shook my hand, and, um, you know, so I tried to, because we had this, then we had like a 40-minute uh, drive to our hotel in the back of this uh, of this limo, and um, and so I'm trying to make small talk and say, oh, so you came all the way from California, and he was like, uh, yeah, you know, so he's very terse. Yeah. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe he actually did read my book because I'd never heard from him yeah. after End of Science came out. Yeah. I never heard from anybody who said that he'd read it and was irritated. Yeah. And so at this point, I thought, um, you know, maybe he read it and he's just being kind of cool. Or um, you know maybe he's just jet lagged and just just doesn't feel like talking. Yeah, right. That's and, that's and why I'm all the time. When I, you know, I just get off a plane after a cross country flight, and I just want people to leave me alone. Yeah, and you know I just had a bunch of coffee. I was all sort of jittery and chattery. Yeah. And, but then I just I let it, you know I let him be. But and I didn't we didn't really interact um, for the rest of the meeting until I gave my talk, which was right at right at the end of the conference. Yeah. He'd already given his talk. And then I gave my end of science shtick, and I focused really on neuroscience, and said that I thought it had made pathetically little progress. You know, all sorts of theories, all too many theories mm-hmm. of consciousness, very little progress in uh, understanding mental illness. All these benchmarks you have for determining progress, and and uh, none of those had had uh, been passed. And uh, so I, you know, I, I I felt like it went pretty well, and mm-hmm. I went off the stage and. George Steiner, he was um, he was thrilled because I was really the only person other than uh, he who um, who actually addressed the limits of science. Yeah. And so he and I were talking, and then I see Edelman kind of bearing down on me uh, from outside of this pack of people, and he, he came right up to me, and he, he just had this like demonic look, uh, and he, and he sort of hissed it, so not. Many people could hear what his, he was saying, and he said, "I have held my tongue all these years, but now I shall have my say." And, <laughs> <laughs> wow. and he just, you know, told me it's like the Wizard what of a Oz. moron I was, a horrible person, and that my whole career was based on envy of science scientists 
who had actually accomplished something with their uh, lives, unlike uh, me, and, you know, going on and on mm. about how ignorant and stupid I am. And, um, and I was just kind of, well, you know, I, I didn't protest. I figured I'd, I'd really, you know, I'd given him a pretty severe blow yeah, and I just yeah. let him talk. And, so you didn't beg um, to differ? No, I mean, yeah. what was what was the point? Let him get it off his chest. Yeah. And apparently, Peter White didn't say this in his post about the reception to my talk, but then apparently he went around to all the other speakers and to the Gulbenkian uh, organizers and said, I think we can all agree that this was an absolute disgrace to have let this person say these things in public and, you know, he's a he, he's you know an embarrassment to science journalism and all this stuff. But the, the conference and was called Limits of Science, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. And everyone else just talked about their their pet theory and right. You know, all the this, this. something they already had on the on the laptop. Yeah. And not everyone, right. maybe, but that's what how these things usually are. Yeah. So even Peter White, he was taking all these shots at string theory. Yeah. But he then said, you know, his his thing is that. Uh, experimentally we've reached a dead end but um, new ideas from mathematics can take physics forward yeah okay and you know so everybody wants to be hopeful and I'd like to be hopeful too um, I actually said that you know I threw out a couple of uh, big science problems that I thought might be solved one was the neural code but I said maybe yeah. you know if the, if the Pentagon uh, controlled that knowledge then that might be a problem mm. And then I said, uh, you know, my shtick about the end of war. Right, right. So yeah, so you know, it wasn't totally, t- totally negative. <laughs> no, <laughs> but it was. Oh, uh, yeah, that was a trip when Edelman finally. Oh, and then we, when we flew back the next day, I'm in the uh, the Continental Lounge in Lisbon and chilling out, and and uh, and then, sure enough, Edelman comes walking in and sits down right next to me. Well, ESP. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah. it's not ESP. So there's some psychic magnetism that uh, means that your worst enemy will end up encountering you at moments like this. But uh, anyway, yeah. and then he was all just fine. I'm guessing. Well, just just fine. Like, oh yeah. I mean, or not. Oh well, no. I mean, you know, he's he's. Uh, we're not going to be. We're not going to be friends. Um, <laughs> but as I said, I did. I did get along with. Uh, Lewis Wolpert. It was yeah, funny. Yeah, that's cause good. Lewis, yeah, because because Wolpert was, uh, you know, I had I, I feel like I have a lot in common with him because almost after almost every talk that he heard, I'd say, so Lewis, what did you think of that? Like Wolf Singer. So Lewis, what did you think of Wolf Singer? You know, saying we should study ESP. Rubbish. <laughs> rubbish. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and you, didn't, uh, you didn't eviscerate Wolpert in the end of science. I don't think he's in there, is he? No, uh, uh, but in um, in my next book, I mentioned this scene where he'd come up to me in London and was screaming at me oh, for saying that neuroscience is over. So I put it in, but just kind of in a you know in a jokey way. Yeah, yeah. But I actually have a serious disagreement with him, and this has to do with this demarcation problem between you know, how to distinguish between real science and pseudoscience. Mm. That is sort of you know we're sort of touching on here. Uh, Wolpert write a, wrote a book, uh, I don't know if you've read it or, or seen it, called The Unnatural Nature of Science. Mm-mm. Um, the, the, the theme, the argument, is that all real science violates common sense. And common sense, whatever that might be, is an impediment for discovering how the world actually works. Well, I think that, yeah, I think you can make a strong case for that, don't you? No. No? <laughs> no, I actually wrote a I wrote an essay. I'll have to uh, read that. that, that uh, for the Times. Quantum it came out mechanics, a general and special relativity? Those yeah, see, completely the, defy common sense. That's right. That's the thing. But I, I think the the incredible success of uh, quantum mechanics and relativity and other sort of counterintuitive, really strange ideas in physics in the early 20th century, together with 
psychoanalysis, which also was a totally well, preposterous yeah, thing. Science. I want to have sex with my mother. I wanted to have sex with my mother when I was uh, that, that, that's two years a, old. That, that's not a good target, though, because you know, I, I think hardly anyone, in, any neuroscientist, would uh, consider psychoanalysis to be or have been a science. Ah, but you're wrong there, George. <laughs> Gerald Edelman <laughs> oh, thinks that Freud yeah. is one of the major theorists of the sci- uh, of the mind we've ever had. So, um, so does uh, Eric Kandel, does another. Huh. Neuro, another um, Nobel laureate. Well, I would think Kandel uh, would demand some sort of physical physical mechanism. Involved. Kandel was trained in psychoanalysis. Well, yeah, that's true. I, I remember that. And then, um, and yet, he's like the ultimate reductionist. But he believes he's written some great essays about how uh, he hopes that neuroscience science will eventually um, come back to psychoanalysis. There will be some. Uh, Freudian ideas that will be disproven, but Kendall feels very strongly that there's a core within psychoanalysis that will be reaffirmed by neuroscience. Hmm. I'll have to look into that. I actually just just checked out his um, his autobiography or memoir or whatever it, is, ever it is from the library, and with an intention of reading that, it's supposed to be good. Oh, that should the, the Freud stuff. I'm sure it must be, be in, in there. there. Yeah, I mean, I just know his work with the Ecclesia, you know, the snails, and, and just this amazing, amazing research he did on how, um, you know, the, the um, volume level of synapses is turned up and down when you're doing habituation and, and sens- sensitization and that kind of thing. But and I did know now that I think about it that he was trained as a psychoanalyst, but I guess I would have assumed that he had jettisoned all that. Well, he became disillusioned with the lack of. Testability, yeah, well. but he feels very strongly. So I interviewed him for my second book, mm-hmm. and we talked about this. He feels very strongly that he benefited from psychoanalysis, and as I said, he's written uh, he's written a bunch of papers on this future integration mm. of psychoanalysis yeah, gotta, and neuroscience. I got to look into that. Um, but the but the larger issue I wanted to make yeah, about common, common sense. sense, and I, this is what I tried to say in this. Um, in this uh, Times piece, which was, you know, I ended up getting a, a lot of blowback from this thing, um, was that those those th- theories early in the 20th century, and I really focused on physics, quantum mechanics, and relativity, made us almost equate preposterousness, strangeness, oh, yeah, I remember the, yeah, I remember intuitiveness this. This was an op ed piece. With truth, yeah. and I said that's that's fine to an extent, and especially if you have a theory, you know, it can be strange, but then it's confirmed by experiments. Okay, wow, that's quantum. You know, the world is quantum on some level. That's hard to believe, but the data mm-hmm. uh, persuade us that it's so. Yeah. But then I think that this notion of uh, exoticness. Being sort of an, a value in itself. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, that's a different a, argument, though, from from saying that uh, that that, that, um, co- that common sense can be basically constrain the mind from finding out the way the world really works. I mean, that's just been shown again and again to be true. Going back to even Galileo, where um, you know the uh, the uh, laws of uh, acceleration and the gravitational field defy common sense. Well, I guess it depends how you use common sense. So, for example, the the what I said in this piece was that if you've got a theory like string theory, obviously, is very strange yeah. and it's postulating yeah, I mean, extra dimensions and yeah. and you know particles that are actually sort of little loops or or uh, okay, yeah. Lines. So what you're saying is the fact that it's weird doesn't mean no, it, but it, then. Yeah. But Obviously then you have true. to ask, where's the evidence? So common sense tells me that if there, not only is there no evidence now, but uh, there probably is no conceivable evidence yeah. that will convince us that strings are right, yeah. then common sense tells me that this is a dead end. Yeah. And I said, actually, when it came to theories of the mind, that if you have a whole century of um, different paradigms uh, becoming very popular and then sort of fading away. Mm-hmm. So psychoanalysis and behaviorism and uh, cognitive models and then now Darwinian models are all the rage. Psychopharmacology. One after another they sort of come and go. Yeah. Um, 
then you get, common sense would tell you to be extremely skeptical of the next one that comes along. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so well, so I, yeah. It's a modest claim. <laughs> I guess I'd have to see what, what Wolpert says in his book. I'm not sure how I managed to miss that. But. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm, Wolpert is sort of saying that, that, that counterintuitiveness, as I said, is sort of a value in itself, okay. and I just disagree with it, no, because oh, there are an yeah, infinite well, number of stupid, th- stupid counterintuitive theories out there. Yeah, but then common sense shouldn't be a value in itself either. Because a lot well, of except in the ways, except in the ways that I'm talking about. Yeah, so I okay. I, see. Yeah, I mean, phlogiston was a real commonsensical theory of combustion. And to lot right. Lavoisier showed something that no one would ever imagine was true. It's it's kind of you know how when you're you're listening to a scientist who's obviously brilliant and has a very sophisticated argument for his theory, yeah. it's got lots of moving parts, and some of these scientists just try to dazzle you. Yeah. So with somebody like Gerald Edelman, especially with, earlier in my career, I just would have gone, holy shit, wow, this guy, this is so deep, I don't understand it, so therefore, it must be, yeah. it, it must be right. right, it's just beyond my humble uh, intelligence, and you know, the more, the longer I was in this business, the more I trusted my sort of my bullshit detector. Yeah. I'm thinking, you know, he says, this is, the brain isn't a computer. Here, let me show you how my computer demonstrates my theory. And I'm going, what the? Yeah. Wait, yeah. you know, yeah. that's, that's a <laughs> common sense reaction, right? Yeah, yeah. The so, emperor had no clothes. Yeah. Material clothes detecting instinct. Right. Hey, you know, I was thinking, you know, I, we should do some real science. We've been talking about all this really wild stuff. And, and you're talking about science that um, is actually subject to experiment. So, uh-huh. as a science times first, I'm going to try to do an experiment right here, right now. Oh, far out! How does that sound? Well, I'll have to wait to see it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you. Tomorrow, I'll give you. A, I'll give you a um, blow by blow description here. Now, okay, it's going to involve me having to change cameras, which I will do now. Oh, man, you're really taking it to the next step. I know, we're really pushing George. the envelope here. Okay, now, if you if you were able to see what the audience is seeing, you would see this weird device, which is on the desk on the other side of my room. And this is called a Wimshurst machine, which was invented in the 19th century by James Wimshurst. And it's basically a static electricity generator. Okay, I've moved over over to the machine now. And there are these two plates made in this case out of plexiglass and when you turn the crank it starts spinning in opposite directions and then there's a spark that jumps between these two electrodes so what's hey, happening George? is it's charging these two Leyden jars you know which is what hey, Ben George. Franklin played around with with his lightning and these sparks are jumping like about a one inch gap here now, I can't I think, you can probably hear I think that spark. spark is interfering with the reception. Ah, okay. Now I'm holding up a book so you can see the spark. Now can you hear me? Uh, the spark actually, the spark, yeah, the electromagnetic field actually scrambled my wireless phone signal. Yeah, cool. I couldn't. I <laughs> wow. Hey, it's like one of those uh, cell phone jammers. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's. Uh, oh, okay. That was. Anyway, I calculated. So the spark is jumping one inch, and there's something called the, um, it's called the um, dielectric, the dielectric breakdown voltage of the air, Uh which is, um, it's about 3,000 volts a millimeter. So that means that by turning this crank on this little machine, I'm generating, well, one inch, I'm generating about 75,000 volts. Holy shit, electricity. So isn't that cool? Could you, is this potentially, I mean, could you have a fatal accident? No, actually, when, when you see the video, you'll see at the end I touched the two electrodes and got a bit of a shock. But even when you take off a wool sweater on a dry winter day, if you see a spark that's jumping like an inch, which is possible, uh-huh. or even half an inch, this is like tens of thousands of volts of very low is that current right? electricity. Geez, I, I used to work at an uh, electronics uh, electrical engineering magazine, and uh, <laughs> so, yeah. I should know this stuff. But, but isn't it? It just 
the, this is so wonderfully mysterious. I mean, we have these theories that explain what's happening and how the Wimshurst machine with the two plates moving in opposite directions are building up this charge of electrons, and then you actually see the sparks go, and you smell the ozone in the air, and um, you know, it makes it all seem very real and visceral in a way that I'm really starting to appreciate after reading about too much string theory. That's... that's um that's really a, uh, you know, I, it, this is inspired. I feel like uh, I should be doing these sorts of things myself. Yeah, I, I have more. I figure I'll, I'll try to do one of these every time we get together because I have something. The, the best one I have is something called a, um, a Rumskorf coil that'll put out about three hundred thousand volts. But <laughs> you know, one thing that, that one's uh, dangerous. I think the very last word at the conference was given to Freeman Dyson, uh-huh. and uh, he said he spelled out this vision of the future of science that I thought was really beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, he said that he thought, you know, Dyson is he's he's really uh, sort of a democ- democratic grassroots type of s- scientist. Yeah. He hates big institutions. In a real he romantic hates in all the best ways. It, it, yeah, and uh, you know, there's. You, I I feel like you know, there's a part of me that that is thinking of objections to it, but I sort of suppress that because it is such a beautiful romantic vision. Basically, he says that the cost of computation and of scientific instruments will continue to go down so much that anybody can play the game of science. You can have um, uh, poor people, people in the third world young people, people all around the world can play the game of science and who knows where it will go. Oh, that's then. wonderful. Yeah, some of this is a little alarming because he actually said that... Well, the genetic uh, engineering kit that you'll yeah, <laughs> yeah, be able to... Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... But, you know, it's you can just genetic- great to be able to do this stuff in your own own home, I think, instead of you know, I mean, even you know, in science classes now, it's all they're, they're showing si- computer simulations of these things instead of the real hands-on. You know, I remember taking a science class, a mandatory part of the science uh, part part of the program, and I think the um, I think I was in the eighth grade, and um, and you know, when it, we'd have science like one morning a week, and they would take out these old Crookes tubes and Geissler tubes and fire them up with high voltage generators and it was really cool stuff so I've, I've been you? kind of collecting accumulating these things on eBay and doing them myself oh I was going to ask you where you got so you get it on eBay rather than some of these science instrument yeah uh, this this, this wind source machine is a real inexpensive one it's actually sold by a science supply company and but they happen to sell through eBay and it took me the longest time to get it adjusted to where it would work but the other things I have, like I, I like this coil that I have is from from the Czech Republic, and and I'll hook that up sometime. That'll probably blast the phone signal, you know, completely. <laughs> Jeez, you know, I don't know uh, what this George, is doing to my neighbor's TV, but uh, <laughs> George, you could become the. Um, I don't even know if Scientific American has this anymore, but they used to have. Oh, the amateur scientist. Yeah, it was yeah. one of their greatest. Features a lot yeah. of. I've met a lot of scientists who became science scientists because they were inspired by. Yeah, I found that it column. inspiring when I was a kid. But I, I don't do these things you know, really precisely enough. Probably. <laughs> I just well, mostly enjoy the spectacle and just this, you know, just the feel that wow, electricity. Well, so maybe I'm going to make my kids uh, watch you uh, watch your experiment. Yeah, it's it's, uh, uh, it's like you know we talked about garage band television, so this is garage band science. Yeah, yeah. that's great. <laughs> well, so, uh, I don't I don't think we can do better than ending right there. Yeah, I think we're you know we're we're uh, getting to that time, but um, that was good. I I really wish I'd been there in, in Lisbon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You would have this. It would have. They would have benefited from you. Being there, it would have been more fun. But they will both get invited to one of these things uh, someday. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, it'd be fun to write about. So anyway, I guess I'll be back. Uh, we'll be back next Should week. We do it again. That'd be good. Yeah, we need to need to catch up on some more some more stuff here. Yeah, sounds good. Oh, okay, and I'll, I'll haul out the Rumkorf coil and see yeah. if that works. Can't wait to see it. <laughs>